Hi everyone and welcome back to my top 500 games. We are at number 201 which is Street Fighter EX plus Alpha. Yeah this is a game which I believe is not generally seen as very good by many people because it's a Street Fighter game that's 3D and I do understand that there are a particular brand of diehard fighting games that are really not into this game in particular and it's generally not as put in as high a regard as say something like Street Fighter 2 which is seen as amazing but speaking just from personal experience and just from my memories and bearing in mind that I am not a big fighting game enthusiast but I put this game at number 201. I do like the alpha characters, the EX alpha characters. Is, is that what they are? The alpha characters? You know like Sakura? and Skullamania, especially Skullamania. Skullamania is my favourite. Pullen and all that lot. The core concept is just as it would be in any fighting game where you can play through arcade mode and if you complete it you will unlock the ending for that character. I did like how in this particular game once you saw a character's ending you unlocked it in this movie theatre so you could actually go back and save on your memory card and then watch it again. Not that the endings in this game were very good but it was something I guess and I like that. I also remember that M. Bison was the final boss but if you did something or you played on a high difficulty or something like that then you would end up fighting Akuma as the final boss. But I don't remember exactly what the criteria were. But I think what makes this game stand out and what I did like about this game was the practice mode because practice mode is in most fighting games it's just a thing that's there so that you can test out your different skills so that you can see the buttons on screen as you press them to make sure that you're doing the combos right you can set the enemy up to fight back or just stand there so you can try out different skills but practice mode in this game it was used to actually unlock things what happened was you had this big grid where each character was represented by a different row and each square on that row indicated a different challenge that you had to do and the further along the, the square was the harder it was to do so you'd have the first one which might be something like do an air kick or do this punch punch high punch thing or do this uppercut and then kick them in the air and you had to fulfill specific criteria as to complete this goal and so what you ended up with was this grid of all these characters and different like check boxes for each skill that you had managed to accomplish and every time you completed one you get a little firework and it would say success and I remember the later one but ones that I just could not do. I just I just couldn't do them. They were far out of my skill range. But I did actually manage to do one of Zangief's because for Z one of Zangief's you have to do this double full circle thing which is kind of like his, I think it's like a pile driver where he grabs, he grabs you upside down and then he spins around in the air and slams you against the floor. But it was sort of like a souped up more powerful version of that. You had to use that on an enemy that kept jumping and it was hard but I did manage to do it and I remember being so proud of myself and then when you do it there's a big firework explosion and it says success and that is something that I would not see in any other skill because I couldn't do them but I could do that one and the more that you did this you had this little bar that would fill up along the side and you would unlock new characters so for example you'd have the evil Ryu and then you'd have the evil Hokoto I think she was called and then you also had the two cycloid like cycloid beta, cycloid gamma. Is, the cy is cycloid the right word? I think there were cycloids. But basically one of them was like this bubble man and then this other one was like this wireframe man. I remember there was one time where I actually designed my own cycloid characters. Like I remember making like a cycloid F which was like this machine thing. It's strange I know but it was fun. And that is the first 300 games done. We are now on the top 200. And I know I say this after every 100. But seriously, like, that's 300 games done. I have talked about 300 games so far. And I still have 200 to go. But just 200 after the next 100 will be in the final stretch where I'll finally get to talk about my top 100 games. I'm just blown away by the whole thing. So let's get on with it. Let's get to that top 100. At number 200 is Shatter. This is a game I played on the PS3 and it's like one of those bat and ball game type things apart from it's very advanced for one of those because 
everything is so fluid, you actually have different abilities so that you can pull or push. And you want to be able to pull towards you because you want to attract all these little gems which kind of add up to your points. And that's what you want. But also by doing that, you also pull the blocks towards you and the little ball thing away as well. But if you blow away, then everything will travel in the opposite direction. And there is a lot of variety with the different types of blocks that you can have. And what is interesting is the way that they're connected, because sometimes you'll have blocks that are connected, and sometimes you'll have different ways that they are connected to other blocks. And you can see it, by the way, that if you push or pull them, you can see them all flailing about in these different directions. Also, there's power-ups, as you probably would expect. There is extra lives. There's ones that make the ball more powerful. There's ones that make them more flexible on whether you're push or pulling them away all sorts but also you can spend your lives in order to release another ball into the field and you can also spend your lives to shoot out a horde of bullets so you've got that element of resource management as well now there is a trophy in this game for completing the whole game in one go which i could never do and I, i've never done it there was one i believe for completing the bonus stages which is where you just have the three separate ball things not really balls they're like just things that you are meant to like knock away and stuff and the idea is that the further you go the more attracted towards you they get and you have to make them last as long as possible that was hard but i did get a good score on that and you also have different bosses as well. I remember the first boss is like this weird snake thing. But you can get the ball sort of trapped in between his parts, which makes it a lot easier. And I also remember there was a boss which was like this clock machine that I did get stuck on for quite a bit. But it's an interesting game. Number 199 is Dragon Quest, the original Dragon Quest. I played this in 2009 because I was interested to see what it was like. And I have to say, this game was a big influence on Level Up Land. When I made Level Up Land, there are certain parts of it that I really, really took strong influence from Dragon Quest. Dragon Quest is such a strange game to talk about because in some respects, it's so good, but in other respects, it's pretty dull. It's really, really hard to describe. It's kind of like one of those things of, oh, it was good at the time, but I really don't like those types of arguments because I think, I think it's kind of silly to say that something was good but isn't good anymore. You know, if something's good, it's just good, and I'm not going to really get into the whole argument, but I will say that Dragon Quest was the first JRPG, so to speak. It was originally made to simplify games such as Wizardry and Akalabeth, I think they were called. But the best way I can describe it is that you have one goal in mind, which is to defeat the Dragon Lord. And the place that you start is just at the other side of this river of where the Dragon Lord resides. But the way that you get there is you have to complete different quests around the world map. Now, so many games these days boast about having a big open world, being about exploration. But man, Dragon Quest is serious seriously about that because yet yeah, there is a lot of grinding I will give you that and you do have to kill a lot of enemies it's the way that it works is that you go through and you have turn based battles it's just one character your character and one enemy at a time and you're just fighting one on one and you start with just the ability to use attacks and you can collect items to be able to heal but as you level up you will acquire more abilities. So for example, there is the heal spell, which will heal you, and the hurt spell, which will hurt the enemy. Some very basic spells, there aren't many spells, but each spell in the game does have a very specific purpose to it. And you do learn the abilities in a very strict linear order, and it's completely level based. So there's no customization in that regard. There is customization in terms of equipment and stuff, but you will get spells such as Radiant, which will allow you to extend your view in dungeons because there's a limited field of view in dungeons outside which will allow you to teleport outside of a dungeon and return which will send you back to the original castle where the save point is and the core concept is that you start in this one area and almost the entire world is available to you straight up it's just a case of being able to get there having the levels, having the strength, having the confidence, having the will, and just being able to do it and having the correct frame of judgment, being able to judge the difficulty of areas, being able to make decent preparations and knowing where your limits are. A thing that games don't do so much these days, a lot of games these days are about just continuously go ahead, do it, do it, do it. Like you might have a, an open world game today where there's like 2,000 of a collectible scattered around this map and you'll just do it. You'll just walk out and you'll just be like, right, there's a 
bunch of them and you'll just do it. Not saying that those games don't have qualities to them, they absolutely do, but this is a game where you do have to really, really be careful with what you do. And for that, I think it's great. Also what's interesting about this game, and this is a byproduct of it being long before the internet was a thing, was that important information was not obvious, and sometimes you'd have to talk to NPCs so that they could tell you things, but what was also interesting is that sometimes those NPCs would be across dangerous terrains so where you actually had to take damage in order to be able to learn information. That's also very interesting. So when it comes to open world and exploration and stuff, Dragon Quest, man. Dragon Quest has it. The only real downside I can give to this game is that the battles themselves are pretty simple and in fact they're very simple and you do have to do a lot of grinding. I'm sure there's techniques and stuff where you can find specific techniques that means that you won't have to grind so much but there is a lot of grinding in this game. Number 198 is Crash Bash! This is basically the next stage up from the original Crash Trilogy, apart from instead of it being a platform game, it was sort of like a party game. So you still had the same setup where you had all these different levels where they would give you crystals and relics and different items based on how well you performed, but it was set in such a way that it wasn't a platform game, you had to compete in these challenges. So for example, you might have this one which is kind of like this far away Pong game, and you might have this one where you've got a pogo stick and you have to like jump across different squares and claim so many squares in order to win the game and red ones were to fight each other by picking different boxes and TNT boxes and throwing them at each other. It's uh, an interesting game. Uh, not really too much to say about it but again it does have that like original Crash Bandicoot 3 type system where you do go through like different warp rooms and you do have you know the bosses at the end of each part of the warp room and you have the crystals and all that sort of stuff. It's really nice and a really fun game to play as well and it's a pretty decent multiplayer game as well. I'm not a big fan of multiplayer but you know it's still, you kind of get the feeling that it was centered around multiplayer but you still, you don't have to play it multiplayer. You can still progress through all these levels without playing it multiplayer. But the story behind this game is quite strange because Aku Aku and Uka Uka are basically having an argument and they have to decide whose friends are stronger through this series of tournaments and you have these two different teams competing. It's strange, but it doesn't matter. It's a decent game. Number 197 is Croc Legend of the Gobbos. This is a game that Matthew showed me and when he showed me it, I wanted it straight away. Such is the case when when Matthew showed me games, most of the time, I just wanted it. That's just how it was. Almost all the time that happened. But Croc is a 3D platform game. It uses tank controls, which I know people generally have issues with, but I don't. And in each world, you will have so many of these gobbles to save, these little orange creatures. And you don't have to save them. They're optional. But if you save enough of them in a set of levels, if you save all of them in a set of levels, you'll be getting this extra level. And there's two of these extra levels per world, if memory serves me correctly. Just like there's two bosses per world and in those levels you'll be able to find a jigsaw piece. And there's four worlds overall, so you've got the regular foresty world, you've got the ice world, the desert world, and then the castle world. And if you collect all of the jigsaw pieces you'll get the fifth world. And I'll talk about the fifth world in a moment, but I'll just talk about the the ways that you progress and you find the different gobbles and such. The health system kind of works on a Sonic style system where you'll collect these gems and when you get hit you'll lose all of the gems and you have to like pick them back up. So it's like Sonic with rings. You'll also have these different boxes that you can smash by doing your air smash thing. And sometimes you don't want to do that because what's interesting is that the way that the gobbles are laid out in the level is that sometimes within the single playthrough of a level you might make one unobtainable so you have to restart the level. Thankfully not the entire game but just smashing a box or something not stupid like that but you will have to restart a level and you've also got some of them inside cages where you need to find the key to open the cage and you've also got these pushy blocks and stuff and also in these different stages you'll have secret doors where if you collect all of the colored gems you'll be able to get into the secret door and there might be like a gobble there or something so each world has two bosses like a mid game a mid world boss rather and then an end world boss and then you'll move on to the next world the final boss of the game is, well, the boss of World 4 is not necessarily the true final boss, so to speak, because if you collect all the jigsaw pieces, you'll go to the fifth world, and in the fifth world, what you have there is you have five levels. You have the first four levels, each of which is a rendition of 
each of the four worlds. So you'll have the grass level on world five, the ice one, the desert one, and the castle one, and then and then you'll get to the final one, which is like this palace. And I remember, I believe I discovered this world before Matthew did, and I think I was quite proud of that because. He had the game before me, but I think I discovered this world before he did. I'm not too sure about that, but I think that's what happened. But the final boss in the fifth world is something that caused me so much trouble because I had no idea what to do, and neither did he. Because, And I know it's not normal for me to talk about final bosses, but I think this is such an important story in terms of this game that I just have to talk about it because the final boss in this game is sort of like what I thought was meant to be like a ghost of the main villain, apart from instead of having like this mohawk, he has these spikes. It's like the ghost of Baron Dante, or it's like an alternate form of Baron Dante, I'm not so sure. And you have these platforms that are floating around over this big pit, and he's floating in the middle of this pit. And you have these four gongs around, and every time you hit a gong, he would scream. He'd go like, oh, like in pain. And I didn't know what to do. Like I hit it, and then he'd like scream in pain, and then it would just continue on forever. I think what you have to do is hit all of the gongs in a certain succession, like within a certain time limit. I think that's what you're meant to do. But I would just be on this level for ages, just hitting the gongs. The ugh, gongs. It's a strange word, I know. But I would hit all the gongs, and he would just constantly scream, and nothing would happen. Number 196 is Penny Races. Now, I'm going to do a bit of a throwback here, because do you remember back when I was talking about Battle of Ian Washington, the first one, I was saying that I would eventually talk about another game where Takara had really good music. And this is it. This Penny Races, it's Takara. It's the same company that made the original Battle of Ian Washington. And they still have that same style of music, that same da 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 style of music. And the music is really good, especially the Tunnel Under the Bridge theme, which is probably my favourite. Also, First Turnaround is another one of my favourite tracks. Tracks being music tracks in this case. But let's talk about Penny Races. Penny Races is obviously a racing game. It's based on the Choro Q models, like the Japanese brand of little toy cars and what's interesting about this game is that it's physics wise not all that there you start off very weak you can barely turn crashing is so unrealistic and so unimpactful it's kind of like you will vibrate when you hit a wall it's very strange but I just have to say that this game gave me a lot of entertainment at the time because it has a really nice single player mode where you do go through all these different stages and you do have to win at races in order to be able to get more money and upgrade your car to get more parts. And that is what I really liked about this game. And I think this is one of the very first games that brought that concept to me, the idea of repeating races and stuff. And something that I make quite a big deal of these days that I've noticed is that a lot of modern games, what they'll do is, because people have sort of accepted this mantra that it's bad to backtrack or it's bad to repeat stuff, so what modern games will do is they'll just have loads of something. Regardless of the actual variation there, they'll have loads of races. Like, you might have all these races scattered around the map, or all these collectibles scattered around the map, and they'll all be very similar, and they might go along the separate race tracks, which may be the same race tracks many, many times, but they'll always, like, tweak it a little bit, so, like, this time, you don't have speed boosts or something. But, where you could look at Penny Races, and you can see it is just grinding. It's the same thing over and over again, but the differences come in the fact that you gain your money, and you gain extra parts, and you can upgrade your car, and that is what makes it stand out. And the more that you play, the more race tracks you unlock. And you actually cannot reach first place at the beginning of the game with your starting car. It's just not possible. But also as you play, you'll unlock the Grand Prix and like the World Tour and you will come across faster cars. And the main one that always sticks out to me is the Black Mary who would always win if you weren't upgraded enough. Black Mary would always come first or second if you were good enough. Also, there's a, a secret shop that you also unlock by playing more, and it plays this music, which is it's quite a creepy, slow music. It's hard to describe. It's like da 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 da, and the menu is listed as a question mark. And my brother 
used to do this strange action with his, like his his finger and his mouth like it's so hard to just i can't describe it in words but it was just so funny seeing him do that and it's sort of like become like a meme between us kind of like how uh merlin from bugs bunny lost in time was sort of like a meme between us that was that was pretty funny but penny races is a game that my brother likes a lot he he ranks it higher than i do but even still this whole thing of unlocking new races and unlocking more dangerous races as well because you unlock like a mountain stage where you can fall off and have to repeat part of the race because you've fallen behind because you've fallen off the edge of this mountain it's something that i really got into and like i say the music is excellent so that wraps it up for this episode thank you all for listening i will see you next time goodbye